scheduled on at 9.15 on a Wednesday morning, May 23rd. But that weekend before, they were in Florida. They had been separated from Henry, and they couldn't find him. He wasn't showing up where he was supposed to. So they took off to Florida for the weekend. Got back here late Sunday night, early Monday morning, whatever, and started hooking back up with the Metfins trying to find him. Well, the, the plan to kill him was already in the works. And they finally found uh, Henry's daddy uh, Tuesday night down at Black Lake. And uh, Ivy told him, he said, well, I need you to meet me out at the old coal house. The old coal house was just an old abandoned house right outside sales. Uh, they had been given permission to stay there if they wanted to. Clyde did not like the place. It was one way in, one way out. Didn't have no water, didn't have no electricity. But they did stay there the night before they were killed. They were stayed about four hours uh, and then left about six in the morning. They were seen down at Kepler Creek bathing, using the bathroom, whatever. And that morning and they came on up into Arcadia. He was buying some feminine products and probably looking for some pain relief for Bonnie. She had been sick the night before, uh, probably withdrawals. You know, she was, a, uh, she was an addict. She was hooked on morphine because of all the pain she was in. She'd been burned up in a car wreck. She had been shot numerous times and Clyde really didn't like her drinking liquor. You know, it, it's got the wrong effect on you that the morphine and laudanum, whatever he could find to ease her pain would keep her knocked out. She spent more time in the back seat than in the front seat. Matter of fact, I really had to do a lot of research to make sure that on the morning of the ambush, she wasn't in the back seat. I mean, you could see bullet holes, you know, in the back windows and the back, you know, somebody might've seen her head back there, and uh, but she wasn't. That don't mean she wouldn't have been heading towards the back seat. She always had to keep her leg propped up. She was always sick. She was always in pain. And she smelled really bad. Her leg just smelled atrocious. Uh, but they thought they were going to pick up Henry, you know, as they came through Arcadia. And when they left the coal house, they went the back way around. And like I said, they went to Kepler Creek, came on up into Bienville, on the left, came on down into Bryceland. They got to Highway 9 and hung a right and went on up into Arcadia the back way. And then they came back this way and stopped here. Clyde came in and got two sandwiches and uh, got him a fried bologna sandwich and got her a BLT. And she started eating on hers, very little. She really was a slow eater. Her stomach was all messed up. Uh, but she got about half her sandwich down before they shot her. His was still wrapped up sitting next to him. The ambush is so dramatized in movies and like in the highway men, that's total fiction. You know, number one, Hamer didn't step out in the middle of the road and go, stick him up. You know, he, he was a smarter man than that. And uh, they never saw the posse. You know, they didn't even hear the first shot. Prentice Oakley stood up, popped off five shots, hit them both in the head, and it was over. But the other officers didn't realize he had hit them. And they, everybody's adrenaline was really going. The Clyde's foot come off the clutch, the car started accelerating. They stood up and just blasted the car. Um, it, it was over in a matter of like 16 seconds, you know. And Prentice Oakley stepped down and looked inside the car and threw up. You know, the boy became an alcoholic that day. Him and, him and Anderson Jordan, the sheriff here, they found a bottle of liquor in the car. They opened it and killed it to settle their nerves. Uh, Henderson Jordan woke up two days after the ambush. He was 38 years old and his hair turned solid white. I mean, the, 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 the stress was unbelievable. And the aftermath, I mean, it wasn't even like the guys had the time to just calm down a little bit. After they were killed, then the real chaos started. You know, people came from everywhere. A thousand people showed up at the ambush site before they could even move the car or the bodies. Um, the car was heading south but for the record to get it, some guys went out there and picked the car up, literally picked the car up and turned it around and set it back down and the record could get it and he pulled off with it. They stopped up here at the school. The story was that the record overheated and he had to stop. 
And that was the, the story they finally came up with because they were ridiculed so bad about stopping at the school. You know, you, you, it's hard to imagine what the inside of that car looked like. And the smell was overbearing. You know, I mean, I talked to a lot of people back in the 80s that were there that morning that were kids. You know, some of the kids and their families moved. They were having nightmares after this. And, but they took them on up into Arcadia and they unloaded their bodies. 20,000 people showed up in Arcadia that day. This was a town of 4,000 people. You know, so it, they were overwhelmed. They ran out of gasoline, they ran out of food, they ran out of beverages. You know, they were having to get stuff in there, keep people from rioting, you know, and they really did practically destroy Congress Furniture Store. You know, uh, the, the funeral parlor and, and, and stuff was in the back of the furniture store, which is really, to, to me, still unbelievable. Um, but that's, at first they just put him out there on view and didn't have nothing on him. And somebody said, you need to throw a blanket over him. You know, Bonnie's left breast was blown off. Her jaw was practically blown off. The back of Clyde's head was gone. Her, her right hand was just about completely gone. Uh, they were tore apart. Uh, when they, the funeral parlor fixed them up from about here up. But when they got Bonnie back to Dallas, they tried to work on her. They had to re-break her jaw and try to reset it. But they couldn't embalm her. So she's, during the viewing and stuff, it was terrible. You know, the smell was terrible. Uh, her mother was, you know, just almost uncontrollable. Um, Buster, her brother, he's the one that came down here and got her body and took her back home. He became an alcoholic. You know, this it was really just, uh, it was the biggest thing that ever happened to be in Bill Parish, but it really was uh, a circus. You know, a lot of people around here, um, helped them out, fed them, gave them places to hide. They didn't want to be caught with them because they knew Clyde was going to go out in a hail of bullets. If you're with him, you might get caught in the crossfire. But, you know, everybody knew he wasn't going to surrender. But most people around here felt sorry for Bonnie. You know, she couldn't walk. She really was a pathetic-looking little thing by the time she was killed. Um, they did manage to uh, embalm Clyde. They did it like section at a time. And um, I always wish they'd have made death masks for him, but you know, they, I don't know how that works, but obviously their face was so messed up and the way they had so much wax on them uh, to kind of put him back into some kind of shape. But they did, the mortician did do a cast of Clyde's right hand, you know, with his trigger finger. Because somebody tried to cut his trigger finger off and Frank Anger stopped him. They tried to cut his ear off. And they stopped him. One of his ears was just dangling. You know, he just had some skin holding it up. So, but they didn't get him. But the mortician down in, in Dallas made a, a cast of his hand. And one of the newspaper men was down there getting pictures. And he said, would you like a cast? And he said, well, yeah. So he got, got, made a cast for him. And he took it home. And his wife and daughter just freaked out. You know, they didn't want it. You know, no, no, no. So he gave it to his brother. And his brother ended up having it bronzed and used it for a doorstop for years. I got it from his, I believe his grandson, who was practically an old man. It might have been his son. But they were doing a, 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 a real estate sale. What, what would it be? A, um, they were selling everything. Um, and as they were cleaning out a closet, there was a white box and it said Clyde's hand. And he said, man, I forgot all about it. He said, this used to freak me out. You know, me and my kids, you know, my friends would come over and, you know, they'd see that hand that was Clyde's hand, you know, and it would freak them out. But we ended up getting that for the museum. That was pretty cool, you know. I've been into this since I was eight years old. My grandparents used to know a man named Ted Toddy. Got some pictures of Mr. Toddy over there. He was the last owner of the death car, the real car. And I used to get to play in it. And... You know, in three years, he had done given me things out of the car. Uh, and um, that's what got me in it was the car. But then I got my first book, and it, it, it's just been part of my life since I was eight years old. Uh, I didn't realize they were having a festival here when it first started because my first time out here was like 1982. 
And uh, I didn't come every year after that, but I came out as much as I could because I knew all these people were getting older, you know, than anybody that could talk to me. Boots Hinton was Ted Hinton's son. Ted was one of the, uh, one of the deputies out of Dallas. He came out here with Bob Alcorn. And all the movies and stuff, he always gets credit for a lot of stuff. And, and, and Ted was the low man on the totem pole. But he was the last one to die out of the posse. So he wrote a book. So in several movies, and he's one of the main characters. But in real life, he was Bob Alcorn's yes man. And the highway men, he's, you know, got all this stuff going on. He's there to identify him. In real life, Bob Alcorn was there to identify him. He knew Clyde. That's who they were at. Ted knew Bonnie as a waitress when he was a postman. He'd only been a deputy for a year and five months when they killed Bonnie and Clyde. So he was there as Ted, as Bob's yes man. Uh, our sheriff here um, and our deputy Bob, um, Prentice Oakley and, and Henderson Jordan, they never get the credit they deserve. They did this, not Frank Hamer. You know, I'm sorry, you know, that, you know, uh, Avi Methvin was related to the sheriff here. She contacted the sheriff to let him know what was going on. And so that's how all this came about. You know, letting that Frank Hamer track them down to Louisiana. You know, The Highwaymen's a great movie, but it is all Hollywood. You know, I'm sorry, but a lot of these screen actors and, 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 and writers, they're, 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 they're screenwriters. You know, they're making up stories. You know, they're not historians. You know, they, they don't, they haven't walked the walk. They haven't talked the talk. You know, they haven't talked to these people. They're just screenwriters. You know, they're making a, a movie. And I don't know why they don't tell the true story about Bonnie and Clyde. Number one, it, it'd make your heart go out to them more than what a lot of people probably think they deserve. Uh, the 67 movie certainly did romanticize it, but it certainly put Bonnie in the picture a lot more than she actually was. I have more of their stuff than anyone and under one roof. I've been collecting since I was a kid. Uh, I have, I have a lot of their stuff. I have his watch, a pocket watch, uh, two of his hats, probably have about five of her hats. You know, these hats came from abandoned cars uh, a couple of them came out of Joplin apartment. They could have been Blanche's, who knows? You know, if, if the, the, the story about Bonnie's favorite color being red is just a story, you know, and stuff. It, that's just, that's just bogus. Uh, but I do have some of her costume jewelry, you know, from different locations and auctions. You know, I, I do the auctions whenever they come up. And uh, the people that buy this stuff need to realize that you're dealing with outlaws and family members who are outlaws. You know, a lot of this stuff that's been signed out from his sister Marie, you better, you know, think twice about it. Marie, God rest her soul, you know, she died in 99, but that woman sold all kind of fraudulent stuff. She's all about making the money, you know? You stupid enough to believe her? She don't care, she'll sell it to you. She'd sell an Eskimo and ice cube. So there is some fraudulent stuff out there that pops up again. On auctions, well, it was it was verified by by Marie Barrow, his sister. Really, <laughs> <laughs> the woman was married six times. A couple of her husbands were murdered. She married one of the killers one time. You know, she was when she died. The local law enforcement were investigating her and her husband for stealing lawnmowers from the Lowe's and reselling them. And she was a little gray-headed, turkey-necked little old lady, you know. But she was a thief through and through. You know, but I loved her. You know, she's Clyde's baby sister, but I wouldn't have trusted her as far as I could throw her. The building is over 100 years old. I keep forgetting it's 2024. <laughs> uh, so it's well over 100 years old. Uh, it was, this building here was Canfield's Cafe. It was Ma Canfield. I don't know how long the cafe was around. I mean, at least 20 years, I believe. It caught on fire sometime in the 1940s and practically burnt down about half the town. Um, but it, they, they re, restored it. This has been a furniture store. It's been a game room, a pool hall. Uh, it's been several things. When we got to the museum, it was boarded up. It wasn't being used. 
So we had to remodel all of this. And uh, we opened up in 2005, had our first investigation in 2012. And I don't know how that came about. We've been having investigators come out here ever since. Um, like, I don't participate in it. Um, but there's something certainly here. There's an energy here. I never really talk about it. Uh, I actually had five grown men come in here one day. And they were in their 30s. You know, there were five that were here across the street for lunch. They stopped in here. They were going to go in the museum. And somehow we got to talk about it. And they got scared and wouldn't come in. I mean, I like, man, I shot myself in the foot. These are grown men. They, they wouldn't come in. One of them started saying, oh, I'm getting a tightness in my chest. And, you know, they ended up leaving, so I don't ever talk about it. But I've had people walk in this door and turn around and walk right back out. They said, have you had this place investigated? I said, for what? You know, I played time, and they said, there's something back there. And I'm saying, well, I've heard that, you know, I've, I've heard that. And uh, I've had... And it's mainly ladies, you know. I had a couple of older ladies come in, and they wouldn't cross that threshold right here to this door. They they got in there, and they got to there, and they wouldn't walk back there. So there's something here. Like I said, I don't really participate in any of this stuff. However, when I first bought the museum, I had a little hideaway, rollaway bed that I would stay in. I stayed here for about three months, and I, one night something woke me up, tickling my feet. And when my foot was itching, I thought it was, you know, I thought my foot itched. But after a little bit, you realize something's tickling my foot. So I got up and put my shoes on and came in here and sat down. I have seen an aluminum can shake, stop, and slide two inches. Um, and a lot of times it's just feelings. You know, Stacy was back there trying to dust the room and something kept trying to push her out. So she just left, you know. Um, if you look for something, I guess you can find it. But sometimes it just happens and you're not looking for it. We used uh, an app called Necrophonics. It was uh, recommended to us by a couple people in the field. Uh, so we went ahead and turned on airplane mode and uh, turned off our location, as was recommended to us to do. And uh, we set up by the display case that had the memorabilia for Bonnie and Clyde, which included Bonnie's hats, Clyde's hats, uh, some jewelry and brooches from Bonnie. And uh, we got some pretty clear uh, responses to a lot of our questions. Do we have Bonnie in here tonight? Bonnie. Sound like Bonnie. Yeah. You here? Is that what you sound like? I'm here. Bonnie, are these your items in this case? Can you say your name? You heard it? I heard it. Very good. Is Clyde also here with us? Can you say the name Clyde? Clyde. Got it? Got it. Very good. Very good. Clyde, is this your stuff in this other place over here? Try and speak slower for us. She's your girlfriend? Is that what it said? She's my girlfriend? Who is your girlfriend? Bonnie? No. no. Me. That's what it said. I know that's what it said. <laughs> Okay, so do you have a girlfriend? You. Okay, sir. Who? So right now we're standing in the, a museum dedicated just for y'all. What do you think about this museum? Do you want us to say a prayer for you? Who's all 
here with us today? Billy? Billy who? Bonnie, what is your favorite thing in this case? Yeah. Were the hats your favorite or the brooch? We're just well, talking to Bonnie. If Bonnie's in here. Please tell us your favorite color. Green. She said green. So it wasn't red? Bonnie, what was wrong with your leg? <laughs> who else is here with us other than Bonnie? Bill? Who, who's Bill? That's the second time we got Billy. Yeah. <laughs> Billy, what is your last name? That's so funny. Oh, are we talking to Bill Decker, the sheriff? Where are we? What is the name of this town? That's funny. She said my stomach, and then your stomach growls, and uh -huh. she said my stomach. What is the name of this city? What year is it? Can you tell me the year? My name is Angela. This is my husband, Paul. We're just here to get your story. Documentary, documentary. Would you like that? Would you like to get your true story out? The truth? Yes, the truth. What's an artifact in here that means something to you? During the Estes method, uh, when Angela was doing the Estes method, uh, we went to uh, to the corner of the room, and I had walked. I was walking around back there trying to uh, spark conversation with the spirits. And when I got to the gun case, my back was turned to the gun case, 
and Angela had said, uh, turn around. So I turn around and there's the gun case. So I'm looking at it, trying to pick up a name, seeing all the plaques, if there was any association to any name to the guns. Well, you know, nothing struck, struck me out of the ordinary. So I walked back towards her. And then a minute later, I walked back to the gun case with my back turned to the gun case. And she said, turn around again. Uh, which was, a, I found pretty interesting being that she had a blindfold on and noise canceling headphones. So she didn't know where I was within the museum. And that voice came across twice in the same spot. All right, who's over here with us right now? We heard some footsteps back here earlier. We'd like to know your name. Were you in this car? Right now? Yeah, right now. Are you in this car? Go. Where are we going? Here. Here. Where is here? Did you own this building? Doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. You tough? No, I'm not tough. I'm just here trying to make communication. Trying to learn who you are. Who's all here. Trying to make some new friends. Hey. Hey. You want to be friends with us? You know who you are? You know where you are? Help? If you need help, tell us what you need. A lap. What kind of help do you need? No. No? Did you work here when this was a cafe? Car. I'm right here by the car. So you're associated with the car, not the cafe. Very interesting. Which car was yours? The black one? Beige one? They're both nice vehicles. Dying. You were dying? Were you dying in the car? Or is this just your favorite car? April. Oh, interesting. Give it up. Uh-oh. You talking to the outlaws? You the sheriff? Help me. What do you need help doing? What the hell? Well, you just need to tell me what you need help. I'll see what I can do. I don't like that.
What don't you like? You don't like that I can help you? Were you killed or did you die of old age? He did it. No, give me a name. I need a name. I did it. Well, what's the name? All I need is a name and I can help you. So you running around here? I look behind you. All these guns? One of these yours? Some nice weapons. Roy Thornton. Were you Clyde or are you Bonnie? What are you going to do? Don't know. I don't know who you are. You need to give me a name. Just need a name. I'm not the law here. Something about a hundred. Yeah, well, I'm not the law here, so... I have no jurisdiction. I have no authority. Just trying to get your message out. If somebody you want me to tell something to, just say it. Behind you. Again. Body guns. I'm guessing something to do with one of these guns is yours. I just got like a really creeped out feeling. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop you. One of the things that was really weird during the night was it was about an eight minute segment on one of the, just one of the cameras. Uh, we weren't able to hear it on any of the other cameras, but on one of the cameras, it sounded like a CB radio going off for about eight minutes. And it was a lot of chatter going back and forth. And right at the end, and you can hear it, uh, right at the end, it got real loud and then just cut off the rest of the night. It was on, we caught it on the camera by the display case. Uh, I don't remember seeing a CB radio around there on display, but it was definitely something uh, that none of the other cameras picked up. Now, because we had a lot of good responses on, on the Necrophonics app, uh, we went ahead and decided to move to the back of the museum in the autopsy room where there was a replica of the autopsy of Bonnie and Clyde. And uh, it, we definitely caught some interesting stuff back there. Anybody in here want to talk to us? We all do? Yeah. Can you tell us your name? Hey. Angela? Angela. <laughs> That's my name. What is your name? Go 
dumbass. I said, don't ask for dumbass. Oh. My assessment of this location is extremely eerie. There's a heavy feeling in this place. Something's there. Something wants to make contact. Um, someone was reaching out, not just one person, but multiple people. Uh, I definitely recommend this place if you're an avid uh, enthusiast. Uh, it didn't disappoint us. This is what it's about. I want to leave it. You know, when, I, when I'm dead and gone... I want this museum to continue. I bought it for boots because he was calling me and crying and literally crying that if something happened to him, they were going to break it up and sell it off in pieces. I said, well, I'll, I'll buy it.